Rites of Ascension By C. V. Brawny Posters Note The writer added a new scene to Chapter 89, this is just that scene. You need to know this scene almost doubles the size of this chapter. And I am reposting Chapter 89 with this scene in it. You may wish to play that video. End Posters Note Chapter 89 Cool Comfort Added Scene Thorough, as always, Twilight. Celestia put the final report of Twilight's adventure in Manhattan on the meeting room table. The two of them were alone, save for Raven, Celestia's seneschal. I concur with your recommendation for the Duchess. However, what should happen and what can and does happen are often two different things in politics. Twilight put her ears down in a pout. So you're not going to kick her out of the Imperial Hall? Maybe. Maybe not. Celestia pursed her lips as she sipped her tea. It will depend on what the rest of both the Hall and the Manhattan nobility are willing to accept without raising too much of a stink. Let them raise as much of a stink as they want. It's not as if they aren't doing it already, said Twilight besides that, there needs to be accountability if the compact is going to actually mean anything. Seriously, how many of these guys do I need to throw in jail before we get to trigger an emergency dissolution? Don't be hasty, Twilight. Dissolving them only means they get replaced, and under the current compact, I must choose other nobles from their duchies before I renegotiate a new compact. I'm deliberately trying to avoid that. Twilight raised her eyebrow. Okay, princess. It's time to put your cards on the table. It's just us, I promise not to leak your plans. What is your goal here? Celestia frowned before looking around the room, then lit her horn to saturate the chamber with magic. I'm pretty sure you've gathered that I want to reduce the power of the nobility, correct? Twilight nodded. That much is obvious. Herein is the conundrum. Replacing a pony or two might help some, but the power they hold pales in comparison to the power of the system. Changing a system is much harder than changing who is in charge. Right now, most power is situated at the level of the duchy. This is the case for both duchy-level decisions and crown-level decisions. If a duchy wants to make a law for themselves, it falls to a duke's purview. If ponies want a crown law changed, it's the same purview. I want to separate the link. That's the key conflict I've been working on for the last few decades. Twilight chewed on her cheek a little. That's... I fail to see how this will solve all our problems. Celestia sighed and laid down in front of Twilight, wings drooping and ears flat. This is something most ponies don't understand, Twilight. Politics isn't a sprint, it's a never-ending marathon. A generation of ponies might fight and struggle for one key change, but that won't ever be enough. Cultures change over time. We, as immortals, can guide things but we can't control it. Not totally at least, and after a certain point, you get extremely diminishing returns. Not to mention the change technology can bring. As a result, the needs of the ponies change all the time, and thus, new movements are created while old ones either die or try to keep things the way they are. What I'm trying to do won't solve all our problems, no. It's a subtle change, but an important one and it's a step towards progress. Twilight murmured something to herself. She wasn't sure what. It was likely her thoughts overspilling her mind and getting extra rumination in her mouth. So, what's the new structure supposed to look like? In its simplest, there would be two different ponies per duchy. One represents the region in the Imperial Hall, another stays home and manages the region directly. But that isn't enough. I'm afraid. There's one other element missing, and that's responsiveness. A chime sounded in Twilight's head. You're going to make the dukes democratically elected, aren't you? There was a glistening in Celestia's eyes. Kind of. Before a few hundred years ago, a more, pseudo-feudal system was more effective, especially given the wild threats that existed at the time. The ratio of workers to nobles was more equitable. Rule by fiat was fast and simple. 
the ratio got out of hoof, didn't it? Twilight ran numbers in her head. Faster than you predicted. Much faster. My ponies proved far more capable than I gave them credit for. For one, the wild threats, giant timber wolves and the like, were crushed earlier than I thought they would be. They also got an earlier than expected lead on health, as I didn't expect the Imperial Hall to be so gung-ho on getting sewers and clean water installed. I was planning a phase in, but they went and did it on their own in almost every city outside San Palomino. So now what? Twilight took out her notebook and drew a quick chart of the organization of the Manhattan government. I can't imagine having a hierarchy with ratios like that of times past. The depth would be, um, unwieldy. No, that wouldn't do. The current system is untenable long term, but sudden change would be unworkable in the short term. Fortunately, innovations in both technology and legislation make larger ratios feasible with the correct systems in place. My plan was to use San Palomino to test this, but some pony went and found an acceptable dupe before I could do that. Twilight stuck out her tongue. Your fault for not including me. I suppose so. But your actions in Manhattan give me another test bed, and just in time. The difficult thing will be to get the new system in place there. Organizations tend to have, inertia, for lack of a better word. But a democratic system in a large territory won't take long to outcompete the likes of, say, France, which is almost exclusively controlled by nobility. Another chime sounded in Twilight's head. You're going to play the inequality against them, aren't you? Manhattan gets catapulted ahead, the reforms get popular, and ponies literally everywhere else start clamoring for the same rights and abilities. Celestia almost cringed. Yes, I am. I don't like that tactic, even if it will work. And Charlemagne knows this by now, so he'll likely fight me on it. It's hard to believe your support hasn't climbed more than a few points. After all that's happened? It should be sky high by now. I know from your perspective, this all seems so obvious. However, we must remember the perspective of the everyday pony. They don't know most of what you do, they only know of the public fallout. Some things we can trumpet about, and some things are too obvious to deny. But some of your actions as they happen must remain at least reasonably secret for your protection and your mission's success. Also, I'm afraid it's not a zero-sum game. Just because the nobility has stumbled does not mean that the common pony likes me anymore. Rather, lately, polling seems to indicate that they like neither them nor me. It is at times like these that political risk is at its greatest but so are the rewards to the pony who's shrewd enough. Large changes can go through in an instant if the time is right. We must be ready to act when that time comes, but unfortunately, predicting exactly when that time will be is next to impossible. Just let me know when you need me and what you need me to do. Twilight stuffed her notebook away in her bag. In fact, keep me up to date on those things ahead of time. Guess if you have to. If I don't know what you're planning, I can't act in concert with you. Celestia stood and stretched her wings. I understand. Come, let's go talk to Charlemagne about what to do with our naughty duchess. Asterisk. Roast her over a spit for all I care. Twilight looked over to Celestia, who seemed as stunned as she did. Come again. Twilight asked. Charlemagne plopped his rear down in his chair. I'm getting as frustrated as you over these idiots. I've told them time and again to rein in the nonsense, but clearly I'm not getting through to some of them. If Domain won't be a model, make her an example. Celestia scratched her chin with a feather. Charles, if you don't stand up for them, they could rightly call for a vote of no confidence. Let them. Charlemagne shrugged. There's only two, three of them that are either talented or connected enough to be my match, and guess what? One tried to cover up a changeling invasion, another used a slur in the hall and would go into office as the least popular chair pony in history, and the third wouldn't take my job for all the wine in prance. So let them cry crocodile tears and boohoo woe is us all they want. Either they shape up under me, 
or they get crushed under your gilded hoof. I win either way. Celestia's face looked like she had just eaten a bowl of lemons. I ran through two dozen scenarios on how this conversation would play out. This wasn't even remotely in any of them. It's not so bad, though, right? Twilight asked. This gives you carte blanche, pretty much. Not without consequences, though. I don't know for sure how the rest of the nobility will act as a result of this. I might have to keep Domain around in the hall to keep things balanced, or not. I'm not even sure right now. Charlemagne yawned and stood up like a ton of time lag was about to hit him with a hammer. Just let me know what you're doing at some point. My back is sore from the train ride over, and I need sleep. I'll see you in the morning, Tia. Twilight watched him leave, then turned to her teacher, who was still as a statue for quite some time. Finally, Celestia let out a sigh. Well, now I'm really lost. Twilight put her ears back. I can't say I have much insight to offer. What does Luna think? Now it was Celestia's turn to put her ears back, apparently. You haven't told her, have you? Twilight gave her a poke. Tia, you promised. Celestia slipped down to the floor. I did. But I very much do not want to broach this topic with her. It is, sensitive. Tough. You're going to. Because if you don't, I will. It has to do with the lunar rebellions. Twilight opened her mouth, but every possibility, from all possible universes, for things she had thought she was about to say collided together in a train wreck of a noise. You but what do? At the very least, that embarrassment served to elicit a chuckle from the princess. The central issue that started the war was this, when to transition to full democracy. I argued for a measured approach over centuries, with the pair of us as absolute rulers until we could put the pieces in place a little at a time. This would have the advantage of being the least economically disruptive, and protect against backlash if something unexpected happened to throw a monkey wrench in the works. Luna all but wanted to abdicate her crown then and there to install full democracy immediately. No compromises. I refused, and the nobility as it was supported me. When Luna seemed to accept the decision, I thought that was the end of it. But she did something I hadn't foreseen. She bypassed the current power structures entirely. Twilight blinked at that. How? Well, at towns she visited she showed the communities how to organize together. They started making their own unwritten rules, meeting at night to decide on the goals the town had, working together on them. It went undetected for months. It might have lasted years had it not been so successful. A few of the towns had so removed themselves from the need of their nobility save for military protection that they started to laugh when their nobles made new rules. Laugh right to their faces and ignore them. Somehow. Without even really trying, Luna had sparked a revolution. When the nobility tried to crush this auxiliary power structure, she flew into a rage and personally intervened. News of this quickly spread, and towns began replicating on their own what Luna had started. To her, it was proof. Proof that her way could work. I scoffed at her. It was proof of nothing at the scale we needed, and like a fool I sided with the nobility instead of reaching a compromise. Twilight pressed against her panicking stomach. And Luna sided with the peasants. Neither of you would budge, so they took up arms and rebelled against their masters with an alicorn at their side. Celestia nodded, lowering her head to the floor. The revolution spread like wildfire. Entire cities were lost in days. We I had the military, but the knights at the time were very wary of fighting mere peasants. Worse. Luna had the bulk of the blacksmiths and others who the knights relied on. Those that I had didn't exactly support me enthusiastically. Eventually, I started sending Crimson into the battle to put down the rebellion where it was spreading. I had hesitated up until that point because I knew he could be brutal. Yet, he was effective. At least until Luna sent, her. Twilight wondered if she should back out of the conversation then and there but the only thing she could think to say was her guess as to who Celestia meant. 
the Lunar Grand Mage. Evening Tide. She stopped him cold, didn't she? Celestia nodded. I never thought it possible. A brand new ascendant out of nowhere. One who laughed at the training and experience of Crimson Spectre and nearly killed him multiple times and each time, I'm convinced she missed deliberately. That couldn't stand. It was dangerous, but I had to enter the battle personally. We maneuvered our armies so Luna's ragtag mass of peasants would be facing off against us in two groups. I gave Crimson spells and tech he shouldn't have had at the time in order to give him an edge, and I knew I could beat my sister if I had to. With luck, we knew we could beat both of them and put a stop to the madness. I was a complete failure that day. I met my sister, and a hundred kilometers away, Crimson met Spectre. We offered a peace deal if they surrendered, and they refused. My side ran so that I could step into the fight without them getting hurt, and I lunged forward. Luna flew at me, and in the shock of my life, the illusion around her broke. It wasn't Luna I was fighting it was evening tide. She brought her sword against me, cutting my side. All of my spells short of ones that would destroy my army and the city nearby were useless against her. She cut through them or shrugged them off with an adaptive shield. A moment in, I realized what they were really up to. I teleported to Crimson Spectre, but I was too late. All those advantages I gave him were utterly useless against a pony of Luna's skill and knowledge. He lay dead, engulfed in the enormous fire of his own wellspring, his blood dripping down Selene. If I had any sense at all, it would have ended there. Maybe admitted that Luna had a point. But we were both too far gone at that stage. Agreed. Both Twilight and Celestia turned to the corner of the room, where Luna stood, watching them. You couldn't have stopped me then, Tia. Not without killing me. I was bound and determined at that point. You would have been proud of Crimson, though. He faced me with true courage, and had I not caught him by surprise, I dare say some of the things you gave him might have wounded me. Celestia closed her eyes, shedding the tears welling up. We were such fools. Indeed. Our ponies would have been better off without us then. Twilight put her ears all the way back when she tried to say she disagreed. The words never came out. Perhaps you are correct, sister, said Celestia. But all the more reasons to make things right. Tell me, do you still have your hobby from a few years back? I know you were thinking up various democratic structures for our duchies. Luna's eyes widened. Oh. Do, do you really need them? Are you, going to use them? Celestia pushed herself to a sitting position. Perhaps. I want to put one in place for Manhattan, and we have a prime opportunity in the here and now. I don't know which to choose, but you have many available, if I recall correctly. I do. Just, give me one moment. Luna dashed from Celestia's chambers, presumably to her own for a second, before returning with a few legal-sized notebooks. I'm afraid they aren't organized at all. A voice in the back of Twilight's mind said "You, That's okay, it needn't be pretty. Celestia opened the first, and an avalanche of papers fell out of it. Twilight is going to have to give you lessons on organizing, Luna. Luna blew a raspberry in response. Celestia skimmed a few of the sheets, quickly discarding several. Most weren't especially detailed, but included diagrams and light philosophical musings on the margins. This one will do. Luna craned her head over to see. The bicameral parliamentary one? You skipped over a lot of others. I could do a deep analysis on all of them, but this has all we need for now. The important thing is to change the power structure so there's more democracy. Exactly how it's structured isn't as important as whether it accomplishes the task and whether it can be changed in the future if we need it to be. Of course, we'll probably make a few changes as we translate this into formal legal language. I rather doubt we should include the line throwing a bone to the noble's ug next to the House of Lords' responsibilities. Twilight snickered. I don't know. I'd probably pay money to see their reaction to that. Luna lit up. Oh. 
I should have my guard take a picture so we can sell copies. Celestia let out a happy sigh. What am I going to do with you two? Asterisk. And thus concludes my report. Thank you for your time. Twilight switched off her microphone in the Imperial Hall and sat back in her seat, Spike next to her. Charlemagne pulled his chair forward. The Council appreciates your efforts, Lady Sparkle. Your cross-examination will happen at a later date. Right now, I would like to immediately deal with one clear fact, Duchess de Maine failed to fulfill her obligations under the Compact. She knew of a threat from the Changelings, and failed to inform the Crown. I reject your framing, Chair Pony. Demain yelled before turning on her microphone. The threat never gave an indication of being as bad as it was. Moreover, given the propensity of RGIS to leak to our enemies, there was the risk of the information getting out, leading to a panic. From our perspective, things were well in hoof. Luna flapped her wings. So you admit the central issue that you withheld information from us. Domain sat up straight and nodded. I do. I felt that action prudent given the circumstances. Celestia's gavel rang out twice. Whether or not it's prudent isn't your choice. If you were really so worried about it, you could have asked for a private audience with me and I would have taken whatever precautions needed. Instead, you kept it all hidden and placed the whole city at risk, including your secretary. Domain pulled in a breath. I stand by my judgment, your highness. So do the nobility of Manhattan. She reached under her desk, and pulled out a letter. I have here a letter signed by the entirety of the nobility within my duchy. They demand I remain as duchess, and refuse to nominate any of their number for a replacement. Luna's horn aura snatched up the letter, bringing it to her perch at the top of the imperial hall. Bluffs don't impress me much, duchess. They're sharks. They'll feast on your carcass the minute we throw it to them. The Duchess replied with a subtle harumph. I'm better at managing my duchy than any pony else in this room, and that includes my subordinates. Nonsense. Susega, the Duchess of Napon, also known as Watercolor, slurped at her tea. The best of us there is. Naponian interrupted with a loud, rumbling snore. Watercolor flopped her head into her desk and covered her ears. Ugh. And the thought is depressing beyond reason. Celestia's horn aura wrestled against Luna's for a moment, before the younger sister yielded and allowed her elder to read the note. I see. The letter floated down to Spike and Twilight. Spike, be a dear and show the Duchess what I think of her bluster. Spike picked it up and blushed from the weight of the eyes of the entire Imperial Hall watching him. Um. Twilight leaned over to him. Torch it, she whispered. Spike froze. Really? Twilight nodded. Spike shrugged. Alrighty then. With a single breath, the green flames turned the paper to ash. The color in Domain's coat drained out, followed by that of the rest of the dukes. Celestia banged her gavel. I have some small measure of respect for how your subordinates view you, Duchess, but your actions mean I can no longer trust you to manage your duchy in accordance with the compact. That's not something I can overlook. As such, I have no choice but to remove you from control of your duchy. Out of respect for your service thus far, however, I'm willing to allow you to stay at your post within the Imperial Hall, albeit at a reduced rank of 11th. The entire gaggle of politicians within the hall looked like they wanted to explode into gossip like a high school assembly. Even Charlemagne was whispering to Duke Buckhart of the Hinterlands. Celestia sipped her tea, and somehow did so in a way that told the room, yes I said that. It was an ellipsis before she dropped the next horseshoe. Since the nobility won't see fit to give me a pony I can rely on to fulfill their obligations, I shall have to find a different solution. Duchess, you will remain in your current position for three months. At that point, the Duchy of Manhattan will hold elections for representatives in a new parliament that will serve as the civilian authority for that region, and you will transfer control to that parliament and their new premier over a period of two weeks. Watercolor spit out her tea, 
raining down saliva onto the Duke of Merrill Asia. Hey! The Duke stole her napkin to wipe himself off. Sorry, watercolor meeped. Charlemagne stood frozen for a moment. He wasn't at a loss, caught off guard, certainly, but his gaze was thoughtful, calculated. I'm assuming you won't be limiting the election candidates to only the nobility. The ground shook from Luna's laughter. Oh, you assume correct, Chair Pony. After all, the nobility refused to nominate any of their own. Congratulations, Domain, you old tart. Bismare slammed her copy of Twilight's report down on her desk, sending a strangely satisfying slap through the air. You played right into Celestia's strategy. Want to lick her hooves next? Shut it, Domain growled through clenched teeth. Bismare was about to open her mouth again when Celestia banged her gavel. Order. Save the insults for later, ladies. The qualifications for candidacy are as follows, a pony or other citizen must be at least 30 years of age, not be currently incarcerated for a crime, must have principally resided in Manhattan for at least the last three years, and must submit at least 1,000 signatures of the citizenry in support of the candidate within one month's time from now. They must also liquidate all their assets, save for a primary residence, to prevent conflicts of interest. The election will be ranked choice, so you are ordered to have sufficient personnel to conduct this operation. I expect the election to go smoothly. Once the members are elected they will elect a premier to lead the duchy domestically, while the duchess will be charged only with representing the duchy here in the imperial hall. You will convey the will of the parliament, not just your own desires. If you fail at this, the parliament will nominate a new duchess. As for other details, Luna, if you would. Luna nodded and pulled out a large stack of documents before passing them around to every pony. This is the formal charter for the new government, along with outlines and support diagrams and documents. Princess, Duchess Bismare asked. Is this what we can all look forward to? Obsolescence of our great traditions in the nobility. Luna narrowed her eyes. One can only hope. Celestia cleared her throat. There are no such plans at this time, Duchess. And if we object? Celestia leaned forward in her seat. Considering all that's happened in the last year or so, you have two choices. Either accept this solution and get your act together, or I will issue an emergency dissolution of the compact here and now and fire every single one of you. Your Highness. Duke Earth and Pride stood. I have had no time to fulfill my and I regret that, Duke, but it's not my fault this batch of nobles has been infested by incompetence and literal treason. Know that if I must go to such lengths I will not hold you to your promise, as this is well outside your control. But I'm not going to sit back and just let this council dishonor the Imperial Hall any further. Am I understood? The Duke bowed. Yes, Your Highness. Please forgive my outburst. Of course. Duke Pride. Celestia sat back with a small sigh, and a little tendril of smoke rose from her back. I think that's enough for today. You all need time to digest this change and, in the case of Domain, inform your citizens. Please see Pulsar or Raven if you need any additional documentation. This meeting is adjourned.